What's up, everyone? Welcome to Dipped in Tone. I'm Rhett. I'm Zach. We're back. Got a fun episode today. Uh, A very old friend of mine is joining us, one Tyler Bryant, uh, Mm -hmm. which I'm very excited about. I've wanted to have have Tyler on this show for quite a long time, so uh, it's going to be a good conversation. Yeah, heck of a nice guy. Uh, How you doing? Good, man. Good. I'm much better this week than I was last week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, ended up in the emergency room overnight, which was fun. Yeah. Been dealing with a kidney stone for the last three months and had to have it removed. And then there were some complications and just uh, moral of the story, kids, is drink water because this has sucked. This whole ordeal. I, I do not recommend it. Zero out of 10 would not recommend a kidney stone. Oh, man. Well, apart from that, <laughs> is everything else going OK? <laughs> uh, yeah, man, we're good. You know, we're uh, we're busy getting back to traveling. I'm going to be in Chicago this week for uh, Fretboard Summit, which by the time this airs, it will have already happened. But I'm right. incredibly excited about that. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time going to L.A. after that for a thing with Fender that I can't quite talk about at the moment. But uh, yeah. uh, mm. fun. <laughs> what's uh, I, what's new with you? Man, well, I just got back from from Kansas. I drove out to Mass Street, um, which is like a fine drive. It's just is boring, especially by yourself. And so I'm just like kind of I'm running on Red Bull, you know. Um, but by the time this airs, this will have already come out. And it's very apropos because of our guest and we talked about something like this. Boink. Uh, I made oh a tube screamer. God. I'm so <laughs> blown Are you away. Surprised? I'm shocked. Oh, man. Well. We uh, are releasing the Envy really soon. And one thing fun about it is I was, I, I don't know, I got in my head, I should not put toggle switches on them. Okay. They should be push buttons because I thought push buttons are neat and realized, oh, if that thing is not perfectly straight, mm-hmm. won't go through the hole. And then also I, in my infinite brilliance, I, I didn't realize because it's a latching switch, right? It's not like a push button, like, you know, it's, like it, it goes, stays down, right? Um, it has an orientation. So if you don't put it in the same way every time, the switches don't do the same thing every time. Like it would be like, this is on or oops, I put it the wrong way. And oh, now it's off when it's down. And, and here is how small the switches are. Oh, Jesus. Um, that little thing. So there's, uh, it's, it's non-trivial uh, to figure out which way it goes, but I did figure it out. But man, uh, really excited. Uh, I mean, everyone probably assumed I was going to make one of these damn things, but here it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm shocked. I didn't see this coming. But wa- walk me through it. So what's uh, what's your take, and what do the the switches do? So like, I just wanted to make like my interpretation of the classic. So it's not like it in its normal form. It's just a normal modded tube screamer. So has a little more range gain or output, uh, a little more low end, but it has a Lowe's button. Let's say L O W S, not not the hardware not the store. Home Depot competitor. <laughs> yes. So you okay. push that down and it increases the lows. Then it also has a clipping switch. So when it's up, it's like a stock screamer. And when you push it down, it actually lifts the diode. So it makes it a lot louder or fuller. That's what just, you did for the the screamer you modded for me a couple of years ago, right? You yeah. bypassed the clipping diodes? Uh huh. And the, I think on yours, I, I made it a little brighter. And I think I ended up making it too bright. Um, yeah, but I like that one though. So it's good. It's better. Like, yeah. and not having clipping diodes, I think for the people like you that might not like, appreciate the traditional screamer sound like that really shifts it quickly to a different place. Nice. Um, but I'm happy with it and we're, we're really excited. So yeah, this will have already, it will be out by then I think by now we'll go Hopefully. check it out. Yeah. We'll have links in the description. <laughs> also, uh, check out the sponsor of today's episode, which is Stumac. You can get 10% off your order. If you go to stumac.com slash dipped in tone, yes. coming to the end of the summer here, we talk about this every few months as the seasons change. Your uh, guitar setups are probably going to be shifting. Your humidity is shifting. The temperatures are shifting. So go to Stumac and go get you some tools. Get a tool set up to take care of your guitars. Keep things set up and, and playing properly. And uh, yeah, get 10% off your order. Yeah. Check it out. Check it out. All right. So Tyler Bryant, very good friend of mine. Genuinely one of my favorite guitar players. His band, The Shakedown, uh, I've seen in concert many times. They are genuinely one of the best live shows you can go see. It is so much fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, So very excited to welcome our guest, Tyler Bryant. Tyler, thanks for joining us, man. What's up? I feel like I should just start this off by saying that I support Tube Screamers. 
I'm happy to be here, yes. but I think right off the bat, I just need to make my stance known. Okay, let's start there then. <laughs> so you are a, you're a tube screamer guy, but I posit that you are the right type of player for the tube screamer because you're primarily a strat player. Oh, right. See, I love it. This so you're playing right off the bat. Let's let I me. Mean, Take me there. Take. I mean, mm. so why why the tube screamer? Because your Rodenberg, the signature, the TV drive is basically two tube screamers, right? Yeah, On so it's like twice side. as good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Finally. Why w- why the tube screamer? Did you uh, did you do what most people do and just start at the tube screamer and just stop there? Yeah, and man. I know. And- if you guys were to dip my rig, you would be like, this dude needs to be more adventurous. But like, no. I remember. Um, you know, there one, there weren't a lot of music stores growing up, you know, around me when I was growing up. So like I remember getting a tube screamer and being like, Oh my gosh, this is like a portal into sustain and you know, drive and all that. And then I was like, Well what if I had more? So I just got a second tube screamer. <laughs> <laughs> um and so I ended up having just two tube screamers on my board for a long time and then um my uh, my old guitar tech Logan, who's just a total gear nerd, a little more adventurous than I am. He uh, he he had this pedal that he found on this gear forum called. Uh, it was made by this guy named Rodenberg, and I and I liked the pedal a lot. But I had some ideas, so I reached out to the guy. I was like, "Can you do this?" And he basically made me like a classic tube screamer esque type of thing. And then the second channel has more gain, and then there's some bass sort of dip switches for. You know, if you're playing a resonator or something, but which most most resonator players are known for pairing it up with tube screamers in the front of their uh, their Marshall amps, okay. like you do. So <laughs> I was yeah. about to say, wow, I didn't, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> now, doesn't your strat has it has a humbucker in the bridge, right? Yeah. Okay, see, see right there, it's it's way yeah uh, a little left of center for I, for the for for your argument. Red. <laughs> okay, but Tyler and I have known each other for a long time. And yes, the signature strat and you're like the number one has is the HSS, but you also play a lot of just straight ahead single coil stuff too. And I will push back on your statement of saying you're not that adventurous because I've played your rig several times. It's pretty comprehensive. Like you're one of the first people I know of to have a Jex to Les pedal. Like the it was a dizzy tone, right? You still got that that on your board? I don't or? have it on my board anymore, but um I, you know, my biggest problem with that pedal was it was just so big and it was like there was only a little bit of brain inside of this huge <laughs> thing. So I, I ultimately, I took that pedal to uh, XTS in Nashville and I had them make it into a, a smaller pedal and it was just, it sounded the exact same, but that's one thing that I do kind of play with, you know, and I, I played with your fuzz that you sent me, you know, um, which was amazing. Yeah, what was it? Hef- Hefes? Hephaestus? Hephaestus. Hephaestus. <laughs> I know. I, I pick the, the most complicated things. It sounds like a wheat beer. It. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> you know what, dude? Most of most of Zach's pedals could be hipster craft, like uh, super hoppy IPAs. Oh, I hate the Mjolnir, <laughs> the, the Cestus. Yeah. Oh, man. We could, dude, there's an opportunity here for you, Zach, to... Maybe on the back side of the building, you uh, you expand into a brewery there. I, I can just feel like uh, the 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 pain that I have whenever I drink alcohol, like starting to form up in my chest. <laughs> uh, so, what is it about the tube screamer for you? Like, you know, because I like having this conversation. Because for me, I, I get the whole single coil into a black panel Fender amp, but also like I love it into a push amp, um, a, a Marshall with a Les Paul and a Screamer set as like a boost. I mean, it's, I think it's an awesome thing. So, I mean, what is your approach when you're using it? For me, it's probably just, you know, I grew up in Texas and I, I grew up like obsessing over, uh, you know, of course, Stevie. And then like even going, like a lot of the Dallas cats that I, you know, was into, they, they would always have like a pedal or something. And oftentimes it was a tube screamer. You go to a blues jam and there'd be, a tube screamer on the on the floor and I think I probably just got used to whatever that EQ thing is happening and how it reacted to my volume knob and you know it's just for me it's just like a you know home cooking kind of sure yeah 
I love it. <laughs> mid range. You like the mid range. Yeah, and, dude. And it's like it's the way it compresses. And it does actually, it suits your playing very, very well. And like the way that you utilize <clears throat> fuzz and the way you set your amps and everything, like it it makes sense why the tube screamer is connected with you and stuck around in your board for so long. Well, I, I also um, I think I I like it when it's not doing a ton, when it's just like you know, and that's one thing that with my overdrive pedal, it's got, you know, a little bit more uh, optionality with the gain. So I can have one channel set to be like offensive and then the other channel is set to be more tasteful. And then like if I have a fuzz that I like, I can pair the tasteful channel with it unless someone in the front row is playing on their phone or something. And then I can put the offensive <laughs> channel on too, you know? Bam. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about that for a second. You're live your live show. So your band, the shakedown genuinely one of my favorite bands to see live, I've seen you guys live what, a dozen times at this point. I saw you guys on my wedding day. That's uh, <laughs> me and my dad came down to shaky knees fest here in Atlanta and saw you guys. Play. I love it, dude. And I'm so happy you're still married, <laughs> <laughs> but you're an amp guy Yep, through and through. So let's talk about that for a second. Why do you still lug around your own amps, load your own stuff in, play in, you know, a variety of venues, everything from massive arenas and stages and, and stadiums all over the world to small rock clubs. You're always using some kind of amp setup. And the second part to that question, have you or would you ever consider going to some kind of model or direct solution? Whoa, yeah, you guys are getting into it right off the bat. <laughs> this is saucy. Um for me. I I can appreciate the modeling thing a lot more than even some of my um, some of my peers. But in a live setting, I, we've we've done tours where we had to wear in ear monitors, and that's something that I've personally always struggled with. Probably because so much of my joy from playing has come from being in the room and and tweaking my pedals to the room. If it's a large room, I, I want to have, uh, you know, my reverb dialed back. If it's, you know, a small room, I might use more space. And what I've found with the, using the in-ear thing is it's sort of, you know, you eliminate the room. So you've got the sound in your head, which is consistent every night, which is brilliant and awesome. Um, but to me, that doesn't outweigh the fact that all of a sudden I'm outside of whatever space I'm in. And, and if I want to be able to hear more drums, I want to walk closer to the drummer. If I want to, you know, I normally set my amp up off to my left a little bit. So when I'm singing, my amp's kind of over there, the drums are over there. And when I solo, I take a step to my left, you know, and um, it's sort of nature's boost, if you will. So I still, I just like loud amps. Um, I think I, I also get personally offended when I go to a rock show and it's a quiet ass guitar tone, it's like, turn it up, dude. Come on, somebody help us. Feed us what we want. We're at a rock show, you know? And and I just, I want to eliminate the possibility of that when someone comes to a shakedown show. Dude, I completely agree. I loathe the trend of silent stages. I understand the point of it in certain contexts. You know, being a, hired gun player for so long where I was working for an artist, I was at the, you know, the behest of what the artist wanted in front house and everything, which sometimes meant going silent stage. Of Most of the time, not right. But if you're a rock band or anything rock adjacent, my opinion, you need to have stage volume. You need to have amps on stage. You need to have real drums with a real drummer, really moving air on stage because a, it sounds better, but B it's part of the aesthetic. Like you are putting on a show People are paying money to come see a show and whether or not they realize even what a guitar amp is or what it does, they're expecting that aesthetic from a rock band. Yeah. So I completely agree. Well, I mean, listen, I've, we've toured with bands that have silent stages and I go out front and some of them have sounded amazing. You know, some of them, if I go out front, all I'm hearing is drums, you know? So it depends, really it depends if, if we had, um, you know, if if we had a, a front of house guy every night that we trusted, that we're, we're like, you know, this is what we're doing. And, and even more than a front of house guy, it's knowing the PA. We're going to have front fills 
so that the people who got there as soon as doors opened and are standing at the barricade, when we come out and hit our big, we're here, everybody, note, that they're not just hearing ping on the cymbals. Because <laughs> that's another thing is it's sort of, uh, you know, I really appreciate it with, with Aerosmith. Those guys, um, well, I mean, they had they had stage, a lot of stage volume, but even for like people who are standing on the side of the stage, they had like a PA there. Because I don't know if you've ever mm-hmm. gone to watch a band that you love and then you're like, oh my gosh, I get to go stand up on the stage. And then you're up there and all you hear is the drummer. Mm-hmm. So strange. Do you think that there is like a, a wattage sweet spot for people? Like, cause I, I get, I get a lot of questions. Um, people asking like, what is kind of like the average wattage that I should aim for? If I'm, you know, practicing at home, but also have some gigs of various sizes. D- do you think there is a, like a rule that you follow about wattage for like the average gig? If you're, you know, playing, a club to maybe a larger venue? I think there's probably a rule I should follow. I think that, (laughs) you know, and just to say, like, I don't think there's a right or wrong way, you know, when it comes to silent stages or rock stages, I prefer loud stages um, because I like rock music to be loud. Um, But I will say there, there have, there have probably been times where, where my band could benefit from having some of those, uh, the, shields that you see in churches or, or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that there's a, there's probably, there's a balance to be struck. And so the wattage question I think is a valuable question. Um, for, for the longest time I was using, um, well, I mean, and, and this is also to discredit my own argument for a, for a while there, I was using an amp on stage. This is my stage amp. It's 50, 50 Watts. Because that could work in a small club, it could work in a big room, but I know it, it sounds good, I can get it on the verge of breakup, and then I use my pedals to drive it further. And then for a long time, I had a 100-watt plexi going through an ox box straight to front of house because I loved the way that amp sounded, and I wanted to have some sort of consistent thing at front of house every night. And and that amp was just, it's just so loud that, you know, it, even in large rooms, it would, it would, it would hurt people. You brought up something though that gets lost in this conversation a lot, which is that when you're not at the level of touring with your own front of house engineer and you're relying on a different front of house every single night, you really do need to have some stage volume. Even if you're running a modeler or something, you have to have something on stage because you don't know where your guitar or even the other bass vocals, you, everything's going to be completely different every night, depending on not just the room and the PA, but who's mixing. And so having some speakers moving air for the guitar and the bass player, I think is important because it can help sort of mitigate that risk of having a bad front of house night. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've always, I've always really liked to get our dynamics on stage before the PA is even turned on. You know what I mean? To me, that's helpful to go like, okay, the drums are this volume in this room. We're going to be this vol this volume guitar wise, you know, like, and then, you know, Graham Whitford, the other guitarist in the shakedown, he and I will give each other our loudest tones and make sure we're being complimentary to each other. And we try to, to mix ourselves, you know, and um, that way it's, it's, it's less, less room for error when it comes to like, then you're amplifying all of that out to people. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people forget to take into account how a room sounds, because, you know, if you're playing... A uh, building with wooden floors and you know drywall or something, and then the next space is all concrete or whatever. Um, I think it really is up to the band to like tweak it. You know, you have to like your amp will react differently. Everything reflects differently. So yeah, you have to spend that time dialing everything in. Absolutely. So I want to talk about touring for a second because the shakedown. You guys in the ten years or as long as I've known you, you guys have consistently toured all over the world. How has how has things changed for a touring band? How have things changed for a touring band over the last 10 years? Would you say it's, you know, easier now or harder? You know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of similarities, you know, we just, I mean, you've been out there doing it too, Rhett, you know, cause I've been seeing you do it for as long as I've been doing it. And, um, I think, you know, post COVID and stuff, it's been a little bit more difficult to get over to, 
like you say Europe or something like that, like some of the expenses have seemed to, they've seemed to have gone up. Um, and a lot of, I think after that, a lot of the like crew guys that we would normally rely on got other jobs, which of course they had to, you know, so you, um, it's been harder to find like good, um, touring personnel for us, like go, especially going to Europe, you know, after, after COVID or whatever. But, um, I don't know, man. I just keep showing up at the table hoping to get fed. Yeah. And let's talk about Europe versus America for touring bands. As an American band, my experience has been, you know, playing in Europe is almost consistently much better on many, many levels than touring in in the States. Has it been the same for you guys? We've had, um, we've had really good, a good response there from the audiences, which, you know, I don't know if that's because we get better radio play there or um, just because it's sort of like, I don't know, you, you see some like European bands come to come to America and then everybody's like, ooh, exotic, you know? I don't know how much of that plays into it, but we've, I mean, we've also been very, very fortunate to like get to go over there and support some great bands that kind of opened the door to those fans for us to where like when we were out opening for ACDC, we would then do clubs on our off nights and then we got invited to go to Guns N' Roses. So then we did clubs on our off nights, you know, and then getting to do, I mean, we've just been very fortunate with the, some of the support slots that we've been able to, to have over there. And I mean, same in America too. Like it's just, a. Uh, it's just, di- it's different, man, you know, but then like the other night we played in Maryville, Tennessee at the shed. And so I'm going like, yeah, this is the same type of fan that you would have in London. It's like, these are the f- the people that came out tonight and rode their motorcycles through the rain to get here, or, like just as fanatical. So it's just finding the right fans. It sounds like it takes a lot of hard work too. <laughs> yeah. The, there does seem to be like a difference though in with European, like, it's like they will come and see you even if they don't know you just because they know that you're from America. And there is that level of like, Ooh, they're, they're from the States and they're here. They must be pretty good. And then at least in my experience, European fans seem to just listen and be more attentive than a lot of Americans and American clubs. It's almost like there's just a different appreciation for music or maybe the types of music that we play and are into over there versus over here. Yeah, it could be. I mean, that's, I was pretty blown away the first time I went to, um, like the first time we played in France to be like, wow, these people are fascinated by sort of Southern rock and blues. And it's very interesting. How did you, how did you get into this? You know, a lot of the things that are kind of what I would consider inherently American. Um, you know, I mean, I know that like, obviously, there was a British blues invasion and all of that. But when I think about sort of just like the core American music that we as professional music appreciators hang our hat on, (laughs) it's cool that, you know, you go to Europe or South America or, uh, you know, I mean, even like we, we played in uh, Iceland and it was like there People are out there do, raising their fists and spilling beer on themselves and having a good time, just like you know we do here. It's, it's pretty cool. So, what are some of the bands that like really inspired you? Because growing up in Tennessee, you know, I the, I experienced something that one of my like close friends growing up said it's the it's the classic rock divide. You know, like I have friends that are from a little further north and what they consider classic rock and the rock that their folks listen to is a lot different from what my dad and, and people around me listen to. So Skinner, ZZ Top, you know, that sort of stuff was always being played. George Thorgood. Yeah. So what was like the stuff that was really feeding you when you were really getting your chops together? Well, man, it's, you know, my parents didn't listen to a ton of music, but he, my dad had, he had a uh, Aerosmith greatest hits. He had a uh, Bob Seger greatest hits. Um, he had Bon Jovi record, which that was always, I like Bon Jovi, but that one was never like one that grabbed me like Aerosmith did. I was like, this is interesting, but like, 
I always remember hearing the talk talk box and being like, I don't, I don't like that sound, you know, um, which is maybe a, you know, kind of a, a mean thing to say, but I, I just was like, this is goofy to me. I don't like this. And, um, I think that's one of the things that I really appreciated about Aerosmith or if you're listening to like turn the page or old time rock and roll, it was like, for me, it was always just the really sort of simple productions that seemed to reach me. And, um, then it was, I mean, well, in kind of simultaneously at the same time, I was really obsessed with blues. So Muddy Waters, Lightning Hopkins, Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Reed, um, uh, I got like mega obsessed with the Albert King Livewire Blues Power record and just listened to that nonstop and um, Freddie King, BB King. And so then kind of like getting into the Black Crows, realizing that they're kind of doing blues, but a little a l- with a little more attitude. Found myself at a Black Crow show, was immediately like, I have to do this. I have to leave high school and start my own band. So I did. And I moved to Nashville at 17. I watched that Tom Petty documentary, you know, Running Down a Dream. And it was like, I have to get a van. I have to do that. And I, I kind of like took a lot of those records and those videos as if it were, were like, a rock and roll Bible. It's like, this is the playbook. I've been given the playbook. I have to start a band. I have to start writing songs. I have to just drive. We have to drive to California. That's what Tom Petty <laughs> did. We have to go play California. Okay. You know, and, and it's really, I, I'm kind of nostalgic looking back on it because it, it, a lot of the decisions that I made were really, really foolish um, with like, you know, I got a credit card and bought road cases for <laughs> our band and I you know I had a lot of people helping me as well and and sort of like cheering me on but you know it's really you know it's it, I was sort of, I'm kind of like when I look back now I, I was very um sort of bold in my decisions and w- I did not approach anything with caution it was like we need to, we need to do this let's I have a truck let me sell my truck and I'll go get a van and I'll drive a van forever and let's go you know and I mean that that level of fearlessness is the thing that you have to have. I mean, like it doesn't matter if it's if it's uh, starting your own business or or playing music or anything. If you don't have that, either the belief in yourself or or the the lack of fear of failure, I, I feel like you'll never take those steps because there's always that what if this doesn't work out. But if you don't think about that, <laughs> totally. Because I've started I've started so many projects that are sitting on a shelf and I spent thousands of dollars on something that didn't work out, but I'm glad I tried. Yeah. Because well, and they all, they all know. lead you somewhere too, you know? Exactly. Yeah, man. So take me back to those first few weeks or months in Nashville. So you, you bailed on high school, you drove from Paris, Texas out to Nashville. What was that like? So you, you know that you, you knew that you needed to start a band, but I'm assuming you moved there without really knowing anybody. Just yeah, new kid I, in town. Like, what happened? Maybe four or five people that I knew, and um, there were, you know, there. Were, I had a, a a manager named Tim that was helping me out and and really, you know, kind of helping me connect some dots. I got an advance from BMI for songwriting royalties, of which I had made, you know, zero dollars as a songwriter um, at this point. So um, Jody Williams, the guy who was running BMI at the time had seen me play at the basement with my band on a weekend. We drove up to Nashville, played a show, drove home, you know, and uh, he said, you know, if, if, if you want to move here, I can help you set up some co-writes. So I really, I moved to Nashville with the idea of being a songwriter because in my town, I lived in Honey Grove, Texas, and there were not a lot of people to write songs with or jam with. So I took, I took an advance from them on whatever future earnings I would have and told my parents, like, I'm not going to ask you guys for money. I'm going to move to Nashville. I'm going to be a songwriter. You know, who, who, who said that ever, you know, I'm going to go to Nashville and be a songwriter. And, um, you know, I found myself in Nashville and was like, all right, now I have to play some shows. And it's like, well, I have to find some people to play with. So I started going around and was so annoying at first because I didn't know where to start. I didn't, I, I should have started at the music college 
But I was like, I'll just go <laughs> hang out at uh, Jackson's and ask in, ask people who are there if they play music because it's Nashville, you know. You always hear like the mailman's a better guitar player than you. So I, I would just ask everybody, like, do you know a drummer? Do you know a bass player? I'm trying to start a band, and which is it's hilarious to look back on because if I'm sitting at a restaurant and somebody walks up to me and is like, do you know a good drummer? I would be like, <laughs> I'm like get out of here, dude. <laughs> but yeah. ultimately, I... Um, I ended up, I'd, I'd become friends with this booking agent and he had sent out an email to his office like, there's a kid looking for a drummer and someone wrote and said, there's this guy going to Belmont named Caleb Crosby and I called him, I cold called him and said, hey, you know, do, do you want to come jam with me? I'm, I'm starting a band. It's a rock and roll band. and He's like, uh, yeah, sure, I guess. And so he he came, he brought a bass player, and, and we jammed, and Caleb and I have been playing together ever since. That was 2008. So we're still playing together, still making records together, and uh, yeah, I mean, I got, I got really lucky, but my first, my first six months were kind of a lot of just throwing darts and, and like not even coming close to the board, um, so much so that I almost gave up and moved home. I was, I was like, and also just all of my family and friends were in Texas, so I didn't. I didn't really have like a friends group at first. So I was like, this is discouraging and lonely and I'm, I'm broke and <laughs> like, I want to go home and eat my parents' food. <laughs> right. So was there a moment for you though, where that changed, where the, the moment that made you decide to stick it out? Dude, I mean, honestly, yeah. Meeting, meeting Caleb and like all of a sudden having like a, a ride or die buddy where it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then, you know, Tim, our manager had this Ford expedition and, and we put so many miles on that thing. And, you know, Caleb and I's first show together, um, was in Dallas and we got to open up for Erica Baidu at this film festival. And we're like, well, that's neat. And it was, a, you know, an odd pairing, but very cool. And then our next show was in Amarillo, Texas opening for, Ario Speedwagon and Sticks. So yeah. Amarillo's 15 hours from Nashville. We got to play a 30 minute set. So we drove 15 hours, played a 30 minute set, and then drove 15 hours home. So 30 That's hours for do. 30 minutes. You know? <laughs> yeah. But then, I have uh, been there. But that's the stuff you say yes to when you're young, when you're like a young band. You're like, we have to play, you know? And it's as you get older and you do this for a living and you realize like, Oh, if I ever want to keep any dollars that I make, I can't say yes to doing things like that, you know? So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud of how rec <laughs> reckless we were because we really just wanted to do this so badly. There, there, there really is something just to Nashville. I mean, I moved here, I, I grew up in Tennessee, you know, moved here and, and it really is like every, everyone's, so I, you might not know, uh, everyone else knows I worked at Carter vintage drink, drink and literally everyone that would come in was just, they could just shred and it didn't matter how old <laughs> or, or from what walk of life, everyone had something going on and man, it's so nerve wracking. Um, I would get asked to like demo stuff for people and be like, I don't know, get that guy. I heard him playing five minutes ago. He's playing way better than me. <laughs> It also takes a, a special kind of guitar player to be able to just be impressive over dead air. Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't know if, if you guys ever walk into guitar shops and then, especially if you, if someone's like, Hey, show me what that sounds like or impress me. You know, like I ran, ran I ran into uh Rick Beato and Carter and I hadn't seen him in a long, oh, yeah. in a long time. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, I wish I could stick around and listen to you play. And I was like, <laughs> what am I going to play that you know, over dead air, that would be impressive right now. <laughs> it, it's the guitar center syndrome where you sit down with a guitar and you're like, what the hell do I play? I don't know anything. Or like, I remember being a kid and, you know, playing for a few years and kind of getting some chops together. And then you'd go to like your grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and they'd be like, oh, play us something. It's like, well, you want me to play you like the pentatonic chops I've been practicing? Like, what do you, I don't play songs i'm a right like nerdy guitar player transcribing solos of like david gilmore in his bedroom like yeah i can't yeah it, it's not uh 
and I deal with that a lot now doing what I do with the YouTube thing, because that's essentially, I just have to play to over dead air, especially being in a place like Carter where you're trying to make a video or film something or, or like when you and I have made videos together, it's like, okay, what does that resonator sound like? All right, well, let me pull something out. And inevitably you always do. And it sounds cool, but that's like, that's a skill set that I think you have to develop over years and years of playing songs and writing songs. Yeah, absolutely. It's for me, it's always more fun to pl- have, have some, someone even just, you know, someone to jam with where it's like, if, yeah. if you, if any of us were to sit down in a guitar shop and try and play something together for me, it'd be infinitely more fun. So you started producing as a way to save money from demos and you started building out your studio. And now it's, as far as I can tell, like part of what you mainly do, aside from the shakedown and, and writing, I mean, you're most of the time I talk to you, you seem like you're always working on a record or something. Yeah, it's, it certainly feels that way to me as well. Um, I've been I've been pretty lucky to, to kind of be bouncing from record to record. And um, I, yeah, I, I just get a lot of joy out of it. And you know, my, my wife and I uh, started building a studio about a year and a half ago that's kind of starting to round a corner here in Nashville that I'm really excited about. And um, yeah, I'm just kind of leaning into it. I've, I've always tried to follow the things that really excite me. And, and this has just been one of those things that I've kind of gradually been leaning into. And then the last couple of years, I just jumped in all the yeah. way. As a, as a guitar player, artist, writer, producer, engineer, do you think that these different skill sets now are necessary in order to have like a successful career as a musician and an artist now? Because it seems to me that it's becoming harder and harder to make a living just focusing on like one area of your craft, just focusing on being a great player or a great writer. It seems to me that you have to kind of adopt what you've done, which is taking on all these different skill sets and these trades and combining them together to build different income streams and a career. I mean, I, I suppose diversity doesn't hurt unless, unless it's distracting from whatever your main thing is, you know, like I've had, I've had um, different engineers and producers tell me like, be careful, man, it's a black hole. You're gonna, you'll get so in the weeds that you'll forget about writing a song or doing this. And I've found it to be the opposite for me where I, I get a microphone or something and I'm like, Oh, now I have to put something in front of this microphone. And then I end up spending five hours coming up with something. And then I end up spending six hours recording that something. And then the next day going back and chasing it further or whatever. But I don't know. I I think it's different for everybody. There are some people that just are so, so incredibly talented that they can just do their one thing. And that's enough to, to, you know, bring them all that they want out of life. And for me, I've always kind of, um, I've always just kind of been figuring out ways to make it sustainable so that I can do as much music, have as much music in my life as I want, which is a a whole lot. So when we don't have shows, I want to be making music, you know, for, Mm -hmm. for someone who's been, you know, recording and and like getting that skill locked in and becoming like second nature, I assume, how, what are some pieces of advice you would give to people who want to try to start dipping into that themselves? Like for a guitar player, what's, what's a go-to mic or a combination thereof or something else that they should invest in like right out of the gate so they can start making their own music maybe a little bit better than if they were trying to do it without any knowledge? Um, so I, I remember when I was, you know, I was probably 18 years old, I reached out to Richard Dodd, who's an amazing engineer, he did, uh, like, uh, Mary Jane's Last Dance was his, you know, rough mix that he sent the Heartbreakers home with. He's just a legendary dude. And I asked him, I said, what's the best microphone that I can get for my studio? And he said, the one that works when you need it. And I always thought that was so wise and cool. Um, but, you know, I'll say that, you know, I, like, I see you're using, like, a Shure SM7. I, I mean, I got one of those when I was... 17, 18 years old, and I still have it, and I still sing into it, and I still put it on guitar cabs, I put it on drums, it's like, you know, that's a pretty great utility microphone. And I think it's really important to to realize that the gear only takes you so far. I mean, obviously, great gear is great gear, and it's inspiring, and it sounds great, but 
ultimately like a lot of our favorite records were were done on you know minimal setups and and the gear is only just a small part of the thing you know yeah I, I'll echo what you said about those engineers a second ago it is a, as as much as the guitar world is a black hole of gear once you start getting into recording and outboard gear and EQs and dude it's it'll make your head spin you know and so yeah to follow up on on that i would just also say like keep it as simple as you can as long as you can and really understand the tools that you have like if you start with a 57 and a two channel interface like do everything you can with that and then once you start to run into limitations of uh, what you're trying to do then expand into that to break through that limitation so maybe you get a second 57 so you can mic you know stereo mic sources or or whatever you know uh because it is i mean all, all of this shit that i have is you know never never ending and and don't don't be afraid to experiment because there are no rules you know it's like that's the cool thing is some of the some of the records that have have really you know been influential on me and i, and I go oh my gosh how did this guitar sound sound like that it's like oh they plugged it direct and blew the preamp up or whatever and it's like don't be afraid to experiment and push your gear whatever gear you have you know how you know pedestrian or sought after it may be you can still push it and find creative ways to get you know whatever your idea is out of it uh there's a great question in the chat from chris he says uh and i assume the answer is yes are you a gear junkie and then when your inspiration, does it come sometimes from the gear or are you being, you know, writing music and that's inspiring you to find new gear? Abs- absolutely a gear junkie and the inspiration comes from both, you know, the gear and the music. Because mm-hmm. sometimes you go like, oh, um, you know, I need a sound that sounds like this. So then, I'll, you know, I'll call up Rhett and go, hey, how, how do I get this? I, I need a delay that does this. What what do you know? And then Rhett will be like, dude, hold on. I, I got to call you back. I, here, <laughs> check out these four delays or whatever. But um, yeah, it's certainly both. And then and then there's the other thing is because I I'll do I'll get obsessed over a piece of gear and I'll go. I really want this to uh, and I know that if I get this piece of gear, it's going to unlock this door that I've been knocking on for months, you know, and then you get it and all of a sudden it's there and you go, Oh shit. Now I have to make something, (laughs) you know, now what? Yeah. Yeah. Now what? Now it's my turn. So there's also the flip side to that too, where you get the thing that you've been jonesing for and it just doesn't end up being what you thought it was going to be. And then you've got to sort of figure out either how to make it work or just, what is going to work. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I respect that about, about you, Rhett, uh, because I feel like you're, you're pretty good at going, this piece of gear is for me, this piece of gear, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, part of that is what I do with the YouTube channel and having access to a lot of stuff. You know, you just, you start to learn like, you know what? That's a great tool that I, I'm not suited for or is not suited for me or doesn't do the type of sound that I wanted to do, you know? Uh, And you only learn that stuff through experiencing it. And, and the more you experience and the more that you have the ability to get your hands on, you just start to learn like, Oh, you know what? That's cool. But I'm just not into that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And and you're out there experiencing this stuff with your hands. You're not like just uh, reading about it. You know, you're getting real world experience, which is in man, like how many times I've argued with people about like the size of a, a vintage burst neck and they're like, no, they're this big. I'm like, well, you know, I've played a bunch of them and they're not that big. You know, have you played any? And they're, it's like, well, I read about it. Like you got to get out there and get your hands on stuff. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing with all audio gear. It's like that, but that's, that's like one guy's trash. You know what they say? I mean, dude, yeah, exactly. I've been, you know what amp I've been loving recording guitars with lately is my damn pig nose that somebody gave me oh, after man. a show and it's like the pig nose through a, with a rolling space echo and you go like, Oh, this is the coolest guitar tone I've had in a long time. 
Yeah. You know? Do you open it up and do the wah wah thing with it? <laughs> I have, I've done that. I've tried that, but I've never recorded it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so much of There's my time is spent just alone down in my studio. So I, I, I need to get like a second second set of hands to do the wah wah. There's so right. many examples of that, which is like great gear that is now really highly sought after that was just trash for so long until somebody made something cool with it. And then now they're, you know, Mac DeMarco is a good example of this. There's like that Alesis rack uh, delay where there's one setting on it for the phaser setting that he uses for all the stuff that was like, you couldn't give those things away at a Goodwill 10 years ago. And then because someone like Mac DeMarco uses it on salad days, now they're hundreds and hundreds of dollars on, on eBay or, or something. So like, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't be discouraged by like, if you only have access to some, you know, less than desirable gear. It doesn't really matter because you can make some really cool shit. Well, man, some... I, I think about, um, there's an engineer in Nashville named Vance Powell and he's, he's a really adventurous engineer. And, um, we made it, we made a record called the wayside with him. And, you know, I remember going in and being like, I really want to get this guitar tone that sounds like it's folding over on itself. And we were working on this song called loaded dice and buried money. And he pulled out this like, $200 Epiphone amp that just had a volume knob on it. And it's not some old vintage amp. It was like just one of the cheapest amps you could buy at Guitar Center. And it sounds so massive on that recording, you know. But, I, you know, sometimes you get lucky and, some, and then other times you, you're like, oh, this is going to be so sweet. And it turns out to sound like garbage. Yeah. And learning when to cut bait on that stuff too is important. It's like totally. that just isn't going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, didn't you guys make a video about like uh, some PVs or something that, that Tyler Well, had? yeah, we were we were making a video at Tyler's studio. And at the, like towards the end of the video, he just was like, oh, yeah, you know, I was back at home. And recently I uh, found my old first amp, my PV, and you pulled it out. And it was badass, dude. It yeah, sounded it sounds good. Sick. Well, and you know, the, the thing is, in my mind, I had written that amp off as being like, oh, that's just a – solid state cheap kind of piece of junk and then i saw a video of uh junior kimbro playing through like the same amp and i go oh, i have i have excalibur you know like <laughs> yeah, yeah man for sure the mississippi marshall you know yeah but it's it's that same thing and like it takes somebody doing something cool with it and that's that's kind of one of those things that that I think it's important to keep in mind is it's like, man, it's not the gear. It's what you, you know, like he probably plugged into that amp cause it was the amp that was there, you know? Yeah. Like my mentor, this guy named Roosevelt Twitty, he came out to jam with our band when we were in Texas and I knew he was coming. So I called him and I said, Hey, you know, I've got a Firebird. I've got a Telecaster. We've got a 335, a Les Paul, a Strat. You know, what do you want to play through? He goes, uh, do any of them have six strings? <laughs> it's like and he could he could do it with that and so i was like yeah well, you're gonna be set yeah man yeah. yeah there's so many great examples of that especially around nashville you know guys that are some of the best players you've you've ever heard where the gear to them is just they're sort of agnostic about it there's like yeah it's just whatever is is there and they get their sound you know mm. totally yeah man well tyler it's been great having you on man appreciate you uh taking the time Hey, always us. great to hang with you guys. Thanks for having me on. I love, I love the podcast and uh, I look forward to seeing you all around town. Thanks, man. Man, I really love that dude. And I'm serious. Like he, he and I, we talk pretty regularly and never talk guitar stuff. Cause yeah. at this point it's like, we've, I know what he, what he does. He knows what I do. It's, it's cool. It's just what EQs are you getting? Oh, I got this new compressor. Wait, I dude, I just got this new mic. What are you like sending mixes back and forth to each other? It's, it's just audio engineering nerd shit. I mean, that's, now. that's fun. That's fun. Right. And I think like, even though you love both things, guitar is one of those things that you can pretty quickly, like you can just burn yourself out like that. Just like, if you, that's all you think about. Yeah. Um, some people aren't like that, but I think, you know, you and I, for sure, we need a reprieve. Well, when it's your job, you know, yeah. it's, it, yeah. It, and that's for all of us here, you, me, Tyler, like guitar is our job in different yeah. forms in different, different areas. And to be fair, recording and engineering and, and all that stuff is that way for Tyler and it's becoming that way for me too. So it, it may have, but the thing about it is, is like, it's such a, 
it's just a bigger world. Like there's just so much more stuff there that it helps, uh, helps it stay fresh, I think. Yeah, for sure. And you need that. But yeah, yeah. what a nice guy, uh, real deal rocker. Like, man, he put, he can, he can, I've seen, like, I've never caught a show, but I've seen footage. It's like, man, that's a rock band. <laughs> yeah, dude, you, you should go see them. You would really yeah. enjoy their band. And, and the other guitar player, Graham Whitford, another just phenomenal player and their drummer, Caleb, another good friend of mine. I actually gigged with Caleb quite a bit up until the pandemic. He would come and play with, uh, with Jesse Wilson and Muddy Magnolias when I was mm-hmm. touring with them. And dude, uh, Caleb is not only one of my favorite people, but one of the best and most fun drummers I've ever played with, dude. It's it, that band kicks ass, seriously kicks ass. So uh, yeah. Thanks to Tyler for joining us. All right, let's chill. Okay. What do you Uh, got? You You said you had a big one and I've got a big one today too. I got literally, it's literally big. Okay. Um, Mine's kind of big too, actually. Speaking of something not guitar related, I uh, have been looking for stuff to decorate <laughs> or, around. I'm <laughs> okay. tired of just like big blank walls. You know what I'm you, saying? Uh, you're going into your Chip and Joanna Gaines era over there. Your <laughs> your uh, what is it? Uh, um, barnhouse chic. Yeah, thing? they they just say like uh, strings, knobs, love. Or yeah, something please don't this. don't do the thing where you you say what the purpose of the room is on the wall. Like uh-huh. eat. Or gather. No, no, no. No, I, I think if I ever uh, did something like that, Morgan would shoot me in the back of the head. <laughs> this, uh, so I've been going to a lot of like antique malls and um, the National Flea Market. And recently I found this. Uh, this oh, is hell yeah. An original 1984 Ghostbusters poster uh, from a theater. And, did uh, you, yeah. what What did you do when you saw that? Be honest. Uh, I, I went. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> and, out. um. And I was like, wait, is this, is this really from 84? It's in pretty good shape. I mean, there's creases, but, um, it was not cheap. Uh, it was like over $300 <laughs> Damn. Uh, for okay. the poster, but like, that's actually a pretty good deal. Like vintage posters from like, you know, theaters like this hung in, in, in a theater somewhere, uh, are pretty expensive. And for an iconic movie like that, what, love it or hate it. That's um, badass. Actually. I've never thought really about cool. that vintage movie poster collecting kind of cool. And, and I actually got, I've, I, uh, I, I, I was watching a Seymour Duncan video and saw in the back, uh, they were doing something for MJ's birthday and they had a Deguayo ZZ Top promo poster. And I was like, Ooh. that's the coolest poster I've ever seen. And so I found one on eBay and I got one of those too. So if you want to find cool stuff like that, you can get on eBay and find like, just search like your favorite band promo poster and you'll find like the things that they would send to record stores. Have you been to Hatch Showprint downtown? No. And, and I, not because I'm not interested in that stuff, but that is kind of become like a synonymous Nashville, uh, wall decoration. It is, Um, it is cliche and touristy, but I will say if you're watching, if you're going to Nashville, one of the things you should do is called hatch show print. It's downtown right across the street from the Ryman. It is a woodblock printing press. One of the only big remaining ones left where, you know, if you picture those old show posters, in fact, they still make all the show posters for the Ryman, I think, Mm -hmm. but um, vintage show posters back in the day would be printed on these giant printing presses with hand carved wood blocks. And they have a collection of, it might be the largest collection out there of original wood blocks and different typefaces and fonts. And so Mm -hmm. you can go through there and they'll be repressing, um, show posters and different posters we went last year and we bought a huge uh original repressing of the silas green um which was a touring circus in the 19 teens and 20s Mm -hmm. and uh it's it's awesome man like when you see it in person the colors are they just pop and you can see the wood grain of the the block in there and everything so yeah a little tip we got ours framed you should probably think about doing this with that, but we got the uh, UV glass, the protective mm-hmm. glass. It was expensive, but it'll uh, you can hang it up in front of the window or whatever, and it won't fade. Yeah, I got I got a frame for this guy, but it is not going near a window. It's going to stay yeah. <laughs> away from the sun. So, yeah. what do you have? Okay, well, I have two things. They're related. First one is bass strings. Okay, oh. these are Labella deep talking bass. Short scale, great name. flat wounds. Now I bought these Long on name. the uh, the recommendation of my my good friend Phil Conrad to go on my new <gasps> Shabbat. Oh, podcast. I saw that in the video. 
<laughs> yeah, man. So uh, at NAM this past year, or earlier this year, you know, you walk around and you're playing a bunch of stuff. The only thing that I played all of NAM that really made an impression on me was this. And it wasn't this actual one, but it was an identical one. And it was Avi Shabbat's personal base that he had uh, he had just finished. So for those listening, it's basically a Fender Mustang base, uh, but with a Thunderbird pickup in it. So just yeah. a single like Gibson Thunderbird. And this thing thumps, man. It's a short scale. Uh, so if being a guitar player, it's really comfortable. It's easy to play. Makes sense. Um, and it sounds amazing. And I tried to buy Avi's off the show floor. I like negotiated with him for like half an hour and he just wouldn't <laughs> sell it. He's like, no, man, I built this one for me. It's like, oh, come on, build another one. <laughs> and um, anyways, ended up not realizing that I had ordered it <laughs> weirdly. But we during the conversation, I said like, yeah, yeah, I want one. I want one. And then a few months later, he texted me a picture of the body and neck in production and sent me an invoice. I was like, oh, all right. Well, uh-huh. <laughs> guess I'm buying a bass. And yep. uh, yeah, a few weeks ago it showed up. It's a ripper, man. Really, really killer bass. And it's uh, cool. Yeah, going to put some flats on it. And bingo, bongo. I, uh, I I really like Thunderbird and like I'll get I'll give some bass pickups. Like they're very different, but man, they they have a sound and a vibe that nothing else has. <laughs> yeah, and this bass has more low end than my my P bass. Don't be fooled by the short scale length. This. Mm. This thing will put out some some low end for sure. So, uh, yeah, man. And because it's a Shabbat, I mean, the build quality is insane. The fret work is insane. Like, it's a great bass. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, man. Nice. All right. Well, thanks again to the sponsor of this episode, Stumac. If you want to get that 10% off your next order, go to stumac.com slash dipped in tone. Get you some stuff to set up your guitar. Get some setup rulers. Get some humidification stuff. Get all the things you need to make sure that as we move into fall – Things are staying right as they should be. And uh, don't forget to subscribe, like this episode, and leave us a kind review wherever you listen to or download the podcast, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching. We'll catch you all real soon. See ya.